Venga, Ramandi. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. I'm Gustavo. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you, Gustavo. How are you? I'm fine. So let's just wait one minute or so so people start coming. Sure. <clears throat> Did you test if you can share the screen? Uh, I haven't tested it, but I, let me, yeah, while we're waiting, uh, I can do that in the meantime, actually. Just a second. Uh, Gustavo, Jane, Jane will be a little late. But yeah. We should start without her. Yeah, she told me. Okay. So let's see. I hope this works. Okay. Okay. okay, you can leave it there. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Well, let's get started. So we are, you say Ramandip? How you pronounce your name? Uh, Ramandip, yeah. Ramandip. You're, you're very close. <laughs> <laughs> we are very pleased to have Ramandip Gil today for a very interesting talk. He got his degree in 2012 from the University of British Columbia. After that, he has, the, he has a very successful career with postdocs, postdoctoral positions in Canada, in CIPA, uh, in Frankfurt, in Germany, and in Israel. And now he's back in the US in the George Washington University. Even though now I think he's just sitting in, in Vancouver or somewhere. Yes. <laughs> so he's an expert on this uh, multi-messenger astronomy that is becoming very popular in the last five, 10 days, 10 years. And there are many things that he knows that we don't know. So he will be explaining to us uh, part of his work on Gardner Ray Burst, Burst, which he's a real expert <clears throat> from dynamics to the dissipation of radiation. Go ahead, please. So thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, today, I'm very interested to tell you about gamma ray uh, bursts and how my research tries to understand the very fundamental questions related to the GRB physics. Uh, I've designed this talk to give you some understanding of the outflow dynamics that are involved in producing GRBs, uh, the dissipation that occurs therein, and how these flows then go on to produce radiation. But before I get to that, let me start with a brief introduction to what gamma ray bursts are and what makes them so interesting. Uh, electromagnetically, GRBs are the brightest transient sources in the universe where they unleash upwards of 10 to the 53, if you can see my mouse pointer, 10 to the 53 ergs of isotropic equivalent energy over tens of or so seconds, uh, which amounts to a gamma ray burst luminosity of around 10 to the 52, 10 to the 53 ergs, isotropic equivalent. Uh, this bright flash of gamma rays can be so bright, as you can see in this picture here, that it can even outshine the whole sky in gamma rays. This bright flash is known as the prompt emission, and it is only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, equally uh, impressive amount of energy is emitted over a much longer time scale, over days and weeks, in what's referred to as the afterglow emission. And that's something that's observed over much broader uh, uh, wave bands, going all the way from the radio to the optical to the x-rays and gamma rays. So here I'm showing you the light curve of one of the most impressive bursts seen by Fermi uh, uh, Gamma Ray Observatory. Uh, with the peak gamma ray brightness, isotropic equivalent brightness, uh, upwards of 10 to the 53 ergs per second. And it is impressively mapped in all different wavelengths, as, as you can see. Uh, most of these, apart from a small fraction of these bursts, which occur in the local universe, most of the gamma ray bursts are found at high redshift, at peaking at a uh, high uh, redshift of one and two, uh, which is gigaparsec scale, and goes all the way up to redshift of 9.4, which is the current record holder. And because of the brightness and such large distance scales of gamma ray bursts, it makes them excellent probes of the cosmic history of our, our universe. And these can be used to understand various things such as star formation history over as a function of redshift, uh, light coming from the first stars, uh, also uh, population three stars as we know them. Um, it can be used to study other fundamental effects such as extragalactic background light, Lorentz invariant violation, et cetera. 
When we look at the duration distribution of these bursts, we find out that the distribution is bimodal and the short GRBs are separated from the long GRBs uh, and the time scale at which that separation occurs is about two seconds. This a similar bimodality also appears in the hardness ratio, uh, which is shown here as a function of the duration again, where the hardness ratio is simply defined as the fluence in the high energy wave band compared to the fluence in the low energy wave. And here, what you find is that the long GRBs, these black dots are softer in energy and the short GRBs are harder. So both of these things indicate to a dis separate population, short GRBs are different from long GRBs, and they also indicate that they do have different progenitors. So what we have learned over the years and uh, evidence coming from spectroscopic identification and association of um, long GRBs with uh, type 1c supernovae that they come from uh, the core collapse of Wolfray stars that are known for their violent stellar uh, winds as you can see here in the Hubble picture. Uh, when these stars undergo core collapse, they produce a compact remnant uh, that remnant then launches these bipolar out, out, uh, outflows while the outer stellar material accretes via an accretion disk. For the short GRBs, uh, it was long theorized that these should come from the merger of two neutron stars in a binary orbit or the merger of a black hole and a neutron star in a binary orbit. And the binary orbit would shrink over time as these two objects emit gravitational waves. They would again merge produce a compact object, launch these bipolar outflows as the merger debris accretes again onto the compact source uh, via an accretion disk. But we had to wait uh, for the confirmation of this prediction that was made some time ago until the development and operation of gravitational wave detectors. And finally, in August uh, of 2017, we got our, our evidence, the, the verification of this prediction when gravitational waves were detected from the merger of two binary neutron stars in coincidence with electromagnetic signal, which came as a short gamma ray burst picked up by the Fermi and the Integral Space Telescope. So over the past few decades, the basic picture that has emerged is that G uh, GRBs are produced by these ultra relativistic outflows that are powered by some central engine. The identity of this central engine is not clearly known yet. Most likely it is a black hole, but it could also be a fast spinning, a strongly magnetized neutron star called a magnetar. Another object that I study uh, uh, and spend a lot of time looking at uh, its variability and, and different properties. Something that I will not have, get a chance to go into today, but something I wanted to mention. Uh, so the identity is not yet clear. Uh, the gamma rays, the prompt emission is produced uh, very far away from this central engine. Uh, either via shocks if the outflow is uh, not strongly magnetized or via magnetic reconnection or other MHD instabilities if the outflow is strongly magnetized. And the Lorentz factor, the bulk Lorentz factor of this flow has to be very high of order 100 in order for us to see these gamma rays. Otherwise they would be absorbed by gamma gamma annihilation. So to give, you, to give you an idea of what that really means, we know from special relativity that uh, how gamma scales with velocity and then we can work that out and find out that for a Lorentz factor of 100, the flow must be moving at 99.995% the speed of light. I think that's the most impressive and the fastest thing that you find in our, in our universe. So as the flow expands into the surrounding medium, it, it sweeps it up, shocks heats that, and the electrons that get shock heated, they then emit the long lasting afterglow emission that I showed you earlier over this broad scale of energies from radio, optical, X-rays, and gamma rays. What makes GRB so interesting is that they are an ideal test bed for a variety of physics. And there are a number of interesting questions that still remain unanswered. For example, what is the accretion and jet launching mechanism? Is the jet driven by thermal acceleration as you would expect in a fireball? Or is it the more familiar blanford genaic process, something that you encounter in AGM jets? What is the angular structure and the radial structure of these GRB jets? What about the composition and acceleration? Are these jets strongly magnetized or unmagnetized? What's the mechanism that accelerates these things? And then when you have these jets accelerated, what is the dissipation mechanism? What dissipates the energy? Is it, is it shocks or is it magnetic reconnection? And then finally, what is the dominant radiation mechanism when energy is dissipated in the flow? What gives us that prompt emission? Is it synchrotron emission or is it inverse Compton? These are, are all the question that, questions that my work tries to answer and, and try to come up with a coherent picture now, most of these questions are not relevant only for GRBs. 
but also to other astrophysical sources because jets are ubiquitous in the universe. Here are some examples of some of the most impressive jets we see uh, shown here in radio. For example, the radio jet of M87 on kiloparsec scale, uh, the radio jet of Cygnus A on, on much larger scales powered by, in both cases, uh, a black hole of billions, upwards of billion solar masses. On much smaller scales, we have this radio jet from Cygnus X1 powered by a stellar mass black hole. And then similarly, we'll have a stellar mass black hole in the case of gamma ray bursts. Now I cannot show you the jet in gamma ray bursts. I, know I can only show you the artist's rendition because these sources are so distant and so far away that they remain unresolved. So we do not have an idea of how far these jets uh, can scale as we see in other sources. But the fundamental question remains and ties all of these things together is what accelerates them and what is the dissipation mechanism? So one of the mechanisms that's widely used uh, and most certainly in the field of AGN jets is magnetic energy dissipation. Uh, when you have a pointing flux dominated flow where most of the energy resides with a large scale magnetic field which is ordered on some, some length scale. And this magnetic dissipation solves two uh, important questions. One is the acceleration of the flow where magnetic energy uh, when it is dissipated goes first into thermal energy and then into kinetic energy of the baryons in the flow. And similarly, some fraction of the thermal energy trickles down into accelerating the particles. And that is then converted into the prompt gamma rays that we see as non-thermal emission. So one of the popular models that is used for a pointing flux dominated flow, trying, trying to understand the acceleration physics in GRBs is a striped wind scenario. Something very similar to what's obtained uh, in the pulsar wind case, where a very fast rotating compact objects blows up this wind and this wind is permeated by a large scale magnetic field, which changes polarity every once in a while, as you see here. And at some di large distance, uh, larger than the Alfane radius, for example, these magnetic field lines, when they come into contact, they uh, undergo a magnetic reconnection as is shown here in one of the PIC simulations, produce this hot plasma. Uh, and the implication of that is that the, the energy that is dissipated goes into accelerating the flow. And this is the acceleration profile, the bulk Lorentz factor, how it in increases as a function of radius for the standard magnetic reconnection that we know of, uh, for which the inflow velocity divided by C, called here shown as beta, is 0.1. And for that, you see, you get an acceleration profile where gamma goes as R to the one third. Uh, up to the point where all of the magnetic energy is dissipated, which occurs at the saturation radius. Now, the interesting thing is that this saturation radius depends on beta n. Beta n for point one lies here, but what we want to do is, is there any find out another way if we can accelerate the jet? Because R to the one third is not particularly fast compared to something like thermal acceleration where the Lorentz factor would scale linearly with radius. So if you can find a way to, uh, make this beta in larger, then we can reduce while keeping the same terminal Lorentz factor, reduce this uh, saturation radius and increase the acceleration profile. Uh, and, the, and the way we can do that is, is coming up with a way uh, with which we can evacuate this hot plasma that is stuck in this magnetic reconnection layer. And it turns out when you place this system in an accelerating frame of reference, as it would be in a jet, this, uh, this, this system is susceptible to a uh, cross coal Schwarzschild instability, which is a magnetic analog of a Rayleigh Taylor instability, something that you famously see in this Crab Nebula. And to understand, understand is very simple. You have a heavier fluid sitting on top of a lighter fluid in a gravitational uh, reference frame, so an accelerating frame. So gravity would be pointing downwards. So this is one of the MHD simulation that, that's shown here where when the instability starts, it destroys this interface and gives you these finger-like projections where the heavier fluid drifts downwards, okay? So something very similar happens when you have a magnetized fluid. And that's something we wanted to test with a MHD simulation for which we use the code Athena. So this is the initial setup that you see here uh, where you have a lighter fluid, a cold magnetized fluid in purple sitting on top and on the bottom and sandwich between them after some reconnection, a hot layer of plasma, which is slightly heavier in terms of its enthalpy density compared to the cold magnetized fluid. You perturb this, this layer and you see that the cross curl Schwarzschild instability, very much like the Rayleigh-Taylor instability develops over time. 
and completely destroys this layer. And this hot plasma starts to drip down. So the expectation is that we would be able to speed up the reconnection process by having the hot plasma come out of the way. Uh, so, th so these two oppositely uh, polarized magnetic regions can come into contact and start reconnecting. So did we, did we get that? Were we successful in doing that? The answer is, is no, uh, not, not entirely because there are other plasma effects that come into, uh, come into the problem such as plasma buoyancy and Kelvin Hel Helmholtz instability, which give you these vortices so that the plasma sticks around close to the reconnection layer much longer and still gets in the way. And in the end, we weren't able to, although locally the reconnection was quite fast, but globally we weren't able, able to get beta much larger than 0.1, but instead we got beta 10 to the minus three. So that didn't solve, a, solve our problem, at least in 2D. But we anticipate when we go to 3D, uh, we might be able to subside these effects. Now let's move on to radiation. So when you see the prompt GRB emission, this is the spectrum that you see, a non-thermal spectrum, which I show you here in nu f nu or E squared dn dE space as a function of energy. It is a smoothly broken power law. This is the typical spectrum that you see where uh, with photon indices alpha and beta. Uh, looking at a large selection of GRBs, we find that there, there is a most likely or typical value for these parallel indices. Alpha is most likely minus one, beta is minus 2.3, which is not as soft as what you would expect from a thermal uh, emission where you would see an exponential drop off. So it is not entirely thermal. And most of the energy shown here by the peak of the nu f nu distribution, which is here, comes out at 200 keV. This is, a, this is, this is the energy at, at which most of the energy of the burst is emitted. So now the, the million dollar question, the holy grail of GRB physics is what produces this non thermal spectrum? So there are a few ways and people have been trying to tackle this question for a long time, uh, but I'm gonna go back and just, you know, describe you the answer to this, something that I've explored in my work uh, using this uh, pointing flux dominated flow, which is again permeated by these opposite polarity and magnetic field lines in a strike wind uh, magnetic field. So where again, uh, magnetic energy is dissipated, but it is dissipated over a wide range of radii, uh, starting all the way from when the flow is optically thick, going across the photosphere, and all the way when the flow becomes optically thin. Now, the interesting thing about this is that any energy that is dissipated below the photosphere is readily thermalized. So you expect when the flow reaches the photosphere to emit a strong thermal radiation field. And then as the flow moves on to the, the optically thin parts, energy continues to be dissipated. You accelerate particles and produce a non-thermal radiation field. So what you expect as a distant observer to see is uh, some dominant thermal radiation field, but also a non-thermal component uh, tied up with that. We wanted to test the interplay between energy dissipation the dynamics of this flow and how uh, uh, in the end the radiation is produced using a uh, one zone kinetic code, uh, which, which is something I developed over the past few years. And what we realize is that it is how the particles, uh, when they're accelerated, how they're heated, that determines the final uh, dominant radiation mechanism, whether it is synchrotron emission or inverse Compton. So I'm showing you the results of one of these simulations where on the top, I'm showing you the particle distribution as a function of their dimension as momenta in terms of gamma and beta. So basically the, their momentum divided by MC. And here, uh, when dissipation occurs in a very localized magnetic reconnection region, you expect to get a power law distribution of electrons. So we inject that here. And what we see is uh, all these curves show you the evolution of the particle distribution as a function of the optical depth, which declines over radius. So effectively, what I'm mapping out here is how the particles evolve as a function of radius as the flow expands. So starting from high optical depths, going to low optical depths, you see that the injected particles cool and they join a, a predominantly thermal distribution, which was advected along with the jet from very high optical depths. And because we have very high Lorentz factor particles and strong field in a pointing flux dominated flow, we, uh, on top of the thermal emission, which I mentioned earlier, you get a strong non-thermal emission coming from synchrotron photons, which rises as the flow becomes more and more optically thin, that synchrotron emission becomes more and more dominant. And finally, what we see is this spectrum shown here in the black dashed line, which 
when the flow becomes optically hidden, only then you see the spectrum. And it's a sum of adding up all the parts that are uh, above the photospheric radius. Uh, so what you see is that the peak is dominated by the thermal component, the, but the wings of the spectrum at lower and higher energies are dominated by synchrotron emission. Now, this picture is completely different from another way of energizing particles when you have a distributed heating mechanism. For example, when you have MHD instabilities in the flow, they volumetrically heat the particles, meaning the mean energy of all the particles is getting raised at the same rate. And then you don't get a power law distribution of particles, but instead you get something that looks very different. And this comes about because as you heat the particles, they're also being strongly compton cooled by the thermal radiation field, which is being ejected with the flow. And what you see here is a very peaky distribution. And the peak occurs uh, where at, at an energy or momentum where the heating and the cooling is balanced. But then as the flow expands, the energy of the radiation field declines and the particles tend to get slightly hotter. And that's why you see this rise in the mean energy of the particles. But here, the radiation uh, mechanism is completely different from what I showed you earlier. Particles here are not so highly relativistic. They're only mildly relativistic. So they don't lose enough energy via synchrotron radiation, but instead by Comptonization by multiple Compton scattering a thermal radiation field. But what you get in the end is, uh, if you were to look close to the peak of the, the spectrum, both of these distributions look very similar to what I showed you earlier, the typical GRB spectrum. So in one way, you solve the problem in multiple ways, but you create a different problem. You create a degeneracy because you cannot tell between one process and the other. So how do you break that? We have another ACE upper sleeve, which is polarization. So as we know from our radiation mechanics courses, that synchrotron polarization is always partially linearly polarized, okay? Uh, whenever you have an ordered magnetic field, relativistic particles gyrate, produce synchrotron photons, and those photons are always polarized. The final polarization that uh, depends on the spectral index that you see from a power law distribution of particles that radiate the synchrotron spectrum. And it ranges between anywhere between 50% to 75%. Now this system that I showed you here is only valid uh, in a non-relativistic frame. But now we have ultra-relativistic flows. So relativistic beaming and the aberration of light becomes very important. And we have to take those effects into account. So what really happens is as, as this flow going relativistically fast is emitting even isotropically in its own reference frame, in the co-moving frame, the distance observer only sees this beam emission, which is beamed in the forward direction, and can only uh, has access to an area of angular size one over gamma, the beaming cone, around the, the, the line of sight of the observer. So uh, it will not, the observer will not be able to see anything that is beamed away from it, for example, this part here. Now, these have very uh, interesting implications of the polarization that you see. So what I'm showing you here, here are different magnetic field structures. And what matters here is the emission that is coming from within the beaming cone. So uh, mapped onto this, the plane of the sky, if this is the red circle is the beaming cone, what you're interested in is the emission coming from, uh, from within the beaming cone. And remember, GRBs are unresolved. So any observation that you make, you effectively average out over the beaming cone. So for instance, if you have a magnetic field in the flow, which is random and confined to a plane transfers to the local velocity vector, for example, radial, you expect a very symmetric uh, polarization map. And when you average out all over it, the, the net polarization is zero. To break the symmetry, you need something much more ordered. For example, an ordered magnetic field or even a globally toroidal magnetic field, which is uh, symmetric around the jet symmetry axis. In this case, there is more asymmetry in the uh, polarization map. So after you average out over your beaming cone, you expect to get very high net polarization. Uh, it's not only the magnetic field uh, uh, that gives you different polarization. It's, all, it's also the jet structure that affects uh, the polarization that you see. So here I'm showing you a couple of examples uh, comparing the uh, polarization that you see as a function of your viewing angle when you have a top hat jet, something similar to this where you have a uniform jet with a very sharp edge so that the spectral luminosity and the bulk uh, Lorentz factor cuts off very sharply at this angle theta j away from the jet symmetry axis. In this instance, 
you get two very different signatures as a function of the viewing angle, which is shown here, Q, which is theta observed uh, divided by theta J. Uh, you get very different uh, polarization uh, degrees for the B parallel feed that I showed you, the random field I showed you in the previous slide, and the more globally ordered toroidal field. Whereas since it is much ordered, you, you expect very high level of polarization. Because of the symmetry of the B perp field, you get zero polarization when you're looking down the barrel of the jet or anywhere near uh, the aperture of the jet. Only when you're reaching the edge of the flow, you see that it rises because some of the emission is missed and the entire polarization is not fully canceled. There is some residual polarization that remains. Now, top head jets are, are an idealization. This is a, a very useful tool to study GRB uh, prompt emission and afterglows. In reality, we expect the jets to be much more structured on angular scales away from the jet symmetry axis, as shown in this example here, where you expect to have a uniform core and some power law distribution of your spectral luminosity and bulk gamma and the energy dropping off as a function of angle away from the jet symmetry axis. Now, in this instance, I'm showing this, the same B perp and B tor scenarios, the polarization as a function of the viewing angle. You get similar features. However, the polarization which dropped off as you moved outside of the jet does not do so. And the reason for that is you still have material along your line of sight, which you didn't have in the earlier case, which is emitting a, you know, uh, in your direction. And you can still see large polarization, even if you're so much away from the core. So that's one of the, the nice things that you get when you have a structured flow. When you compare, uh, the polarization that you get from synchrotron uh, and having an ordered field, as I showed, showed you earlier, to inverse Compton scattering, what you expect is for, for the inverse Compton scattering case, again, as, as a function of viewing angle, that at most you can get 15% or so polarization. But in the other case, you can get up to 75% polarization. So linear polarization acts a, a very natural tool to use to break this degeneracy between the two radiation mechanisms. Not only that, Linear polarization can also be used to break the degeneracy between the different magnetic field configuration as I just showed you. So here's a result of a Monte Carlo simulation, which shows you, if you were to go out and look at thousand GRBs, what is the most likely a polarization degree that you would measure? So for a B perp, you would measure something very close to zero, small polarization, because you would be looking at GRBs very much along the barrel of the jet. Uh, since BTOR is an, is an ordered field, you expect to measure very high polarization, 50% or even 60%. I showed you here, inverse Compton is only limited to 20% or 15%. So this is, what, this is what you expect from these different radiation mechanisms and different magnetic field geometries. But what happens when you can, uh, compare these with the current observations that we have? So these are the set of measurements that we have so far taken by uh, three different instruments and as you can see, the resu result is very inconclusive. And the reason for that is polarization of gamma ray photons is very hard to obtain. But the situation is going to change uh, over the next few years when we have much better, uh, much bigger detectors, which are more sensitive, and they surely will be able to do a much better job. At least that is the hope. So we look forward to having better results uh, to compare with observations. Now, I've, I've said, a lot about prompt gamma ray uh, emission. Let me move on to briefly in, in the uh, time I have left uh, to afterglow emission. So when you have a top head jet, uh, this long lasting afterglow emission is very different uh, for an observer which is on axis or whose line of sight intersects the, the jet aperture compared to, uh, compared to an observer who's completely off axis. So I'm, sh I'm showing you these light curves calculated by uh, Fabio de Colle in one of our works. Uh, using a hydrodynamic simulation, where you see for an on-axis observer, for, for instance, in the optical uh, band, this, this blue line, it declines from the very beginning. But for the off-axis case, there, it rises sharply and then it declines after this peak. So most of the time we expect to see, or we usually see, uh, declining uh, afterglow light curves because these are distant GRBs. So forget about seeing anything off-axis because you will not be able to see any prompt emission as it is very weak compared to the on-axis emission. But that situation changed when we detected uh, the afterglow from the, the binary merger that I discussed earlier, GW170817, 
which showed a very peculiar rise of the afterglow uh, up to the peak and then, and then a decline. So naturally, we first, everyone, including us, uh, tried to fit that uh, light curve with the top head jet. And what we realized that it cannot fit this shallow part, the initial shallow part. And that is the peculiarity. We know that we're looking at the jet at, uh, from an angle because we see this, uh, this rise to the peak uh, compared to the decline that we see in other GRBs. So the peculiarity is how do, you how do you explain this shallow rise? So it turns out, and quite naturally so, that when jets are trying to escape to the, to the, the outer layers of the star in long GRBs or the merger debris in short GRBs, they naturally acquire angular structure. So here's a density profile of one of the uh, MHD simulations conducted by Lutzaki and all group, where you see um, a narrow core of a jet surrounded by lower energy wings, which is the, the structured part of the jet. And we, when we try to model this with a structured jet, we, we nicely explain uh, this shallow rise to the peak. Okay. So these are the two lessons that we learned uh, looking at GW170017. And finally, one thing I want to mention that uh, when we were conducting this study uh, using our semi-analytic modeling of GW170017, uh, we made a prediction that if there is a, a structured jet, we ought to see a very fast uh, motion of the flux centroid uh, in radio. And that, this is the prediction shown for a structured jet. And that prediction was confirmed uh, very soon uh, when using VLBI radio observations where it was shown that the, the flux centroid motion was 2.7 milliard seconds over this period of time, very close to what we had predicted uh, much before, uh, which is an indication of a superluminal motion, uh, something uh, where, the, where the apparent motion of velocity uh, of the jet on the plane of the sky is going as four times the speed of light, a telltale signature when you have a relativistic jet. So this brings me uh, to my last slide where, um, the message that I want to convey to you is that the future of GRB science is bright. We have many new observatories, uh, both on the ground and space missions coming up uh, in this decade and over the next few years that are going to probe many different interesting aspects that are discussed today in this talk. For example, a GRB polarization. They will look at high redshift GRBs, pr uh, probe the prompt and afterglow emission phases, look at many of the fundamental effects, uh, such as uh, EVL, Lorentz invariance violation, uh, and again, study afterglows using you know, SKA, for example, in the radio at unprecedented precision. This is for, from the observational side. I am a theorist, so the work is cut out for me, uh, where I would like to do more realistic and self-consistent modeling of the dynamics, the dissipation and the radiation by conducting MHD simulations of more realistic jets uh, that vary in magnetization, strongly magnetized or, or, or weakly magnetized, try to re relate the results of the MHD simulation with semi-analytic models of spectropolarimetric uh, uh, models that we can then compare with observation made by these uh, future observatories and try to understand and get one step closer to the fundamental questions in GRB physics. I will stop here. Thank you so much. Gracias. Thank you, it's very interesting work. We have time for a few questions. Anybody interested in raising his or her hand? Okay. Susana? Um, hi, Ramandeep. I'm, I am Susana Lizano. Um, I, I don't work in this field, so I want to ask you, is there radio emission coming from these gamma ray bursts? Oh, yes. Uh, so the afterglow emission that we see, uh, it is seen for a long time, days and weeks and even months uh, in radio. So in fact, uh, what I showed you earlier here, let me go back to this slide. So most of these data points, so this is for the short GRB, uh, the binding neutral star merger that we saw, which was a very close by event, 40 megaparsecs. Uh, all of those data points that you see here are all radio po data points. So you see a lot of radio emission. So this is what's so interesting about radio is, first of all, the emission lasts for a much longer time. Uh, so you can study the object uh, for much longer because 
the prompt emission, the burst of uh, gamma rays, it's like 10 seconds, 30 seconds, and then it's gone. And that's it. So you don't really have much of a chance. You catch it, you know, great. But if you don't catch it, well, then you have to look at the afterglow emission, which is here. Uh, and what uh, I will add to that, what's interesting here is by looking at the radio emission, you can actually understand the total energy budget, which is something that we don't have a good handle on at this point, is how much is the total energy in the flow that is uh, injected by the, the, the black hole or the magnetar central wind. And is there polarization from this radio emission? Absolutely, yes. So that's something I'm very interested in learning about. Uh, in fact, I, I didn't get a chance to talk about here, but if I may show you uh, one slide. So, let, sorry, let me just go to, and it's something, you know, very interesting uh, work that uh, we did recently. So here, you know, when uh, this GW170017 object came out, uh, we made another prediction in terms of what would be the polarization from the afterglow shock. Okay, from these shock accelerated electrons that produces afterglow emission. So we calculated uh, for a magnetic field geometry, uh, which has some sort of anisotropy, which is encoded here by this B parameter, you know, how much B parallel compared to the shock normal or B perpendicular uh, field that you have. So some way, to, some way to characterize the anisotropy of the field behind the, the forward shock that emits the afterglow emission. And so we, here's the prediction we made for, you know, for example, the structure jet here, okay? Uh, and when you tune this uh, B parameter, okay? Zero would be, uh, it is completely perpendicular to the shock normal and larger values of B would be, it is much more along the, the shock normal. So when we made this prediction, it was again, uh, at some point later uh, using radio observations it was difficult to get the, the exact polarization measurement, but uh, the group by Corsi, uh, they were able to put an upper limit of 12%, which was a very useful because that's the upper limit here, which, which I placed. And what it allowed us to do is constrain uh, using just the upper limit, constrain the anisotropy of the magnetic field that is produced behind the forward shock. So, yeah. yeah thank you, very interesting. Another question from Will. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, um, I'm also not a specialist, so this was of a naive question I have. Um, so this is about the beaming. Um, so as I understand it, the, the, the prompt gamma ray emission is only seen when we're looking right directly down the jet at a very narrow angle. Um, but the, the, the gravitational wave um, detections presumably are independent of, of angle. And so you would sort of expect that any, um, any, any event that was detected in gravitational waves was going to be more off axis. Is, is that right? And does that mean that most of the, that right. there are going to be a lot more uh, objects detected off axis in the future? Absolutely. So we in mm -hmm. fact uh, anticipate the detection of much more off axis event than uh, on axis event. And the reason is really simple. The aperture of the jet is quite small, okay? The opening angle in terms of radian is of 0.1 radians, okay? So uh, just by the, uh, the solid angle alone, and because the emission is beamed in the forward direction, it's a very small solid angle uh, that you see, mm -hmm. okay? So most of the solid angle is occupied outside of the jet. So you expect to see many more events. Now it's, it's difficult because if there are so many uh, distant events, we will not be able to see any you know, prompt gamma rays or even afterglow, it'd be difficult to see it. Uh, but indeed you will detect gravitational waves for even distant events. And the idea is that more of, of those will be seen in the future. And that's what drives the next generation of observatory is to catch that glow, the afterglow emission that can then be correlated with the detection of uh, gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. So that, that means that I guess you'll have to revisit some of your earlier models because you had a photosphere that was just on the axis, but if you're off axis, then the photosphere along the sides of the, of the jet will also be important, right? So for, yeah, the, the prompt gamma ray emission will be very hard to see for off axis events. The reason okay. why we were able to see it for, and we only, you know, uh, we only saw uh, one off-axis event and turned out to be the, the GW1717 event. 
And the reason why we were able to see the emission is because it was 40 megaparsecs. So, so most yeah. of these guys are sitting at gigaparsec scales, forget about seeing uh, any off axis prompt emission. The only yeah. way of catching them is the afterglow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Philippe? Yes. Um, thank you for, your, for the lecture. Uh, I, I was, I'm trying to understand this issue. You have short duration and long duration gamma ray bursts. Yeah. Now, do you expect the gravitational wave to come? I, I guess that from the short durations, it's pretty clear that you, you could get or you will get a gravitational wave. But uh, from the long duration gamma ray bursts, you also expect a, a, gram, a gravitational, excuse me, gravitational wave signal. Uh not really. Uh, so as, as you also said that it's, you know, uh, it's quite understandable when you have two uh, binary neutron stars merging. Yes, you expect it or a, or a neutron star black hole, then definitely you expect it. But when you have just a single star, for example, a wolf ray star collapsing into this object, there is perhaps a possibility that due to some asymmetry in the formation of the compact source, uh, there may be uh, some gravitational wave emission. Uh, but it will be rather weak and very difficult to detect. So to answer your question, we don't really expect to see uh, any gravitational emission associated with long duration GOD. Thank you. Enrique? Uh, yeah, hi, Roman Deep. Uh, yeah, very interesting. I'm also uh, a complete outsider to this field. So I also have a probably very naive question. At the beginning, you mentioned uh, that most of these GRBs are uh, come from even large redshifts, but yeah. so if, if this is not line emission, how, how do you determine the the redshift? Uh, where is it coming from? So uh, these are determined, you know, photometrically and spectroscopically. Spectroscopically, we use uh, like Lyman alpha lines. Nice. So, uh -huh. So we use that as an, you know, the absorption feature that you see to determine where these things are, you know, by determining the, the column density that you have in the waves. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are ways to, to do it photometric, photometrically as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the record breaker GRB, I, which is at you know, redshift of 9.4, uh, this was, yeah, this was, a, <laughs> this was a photometric determination. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So you mean from the uh, from the burst uh, from the burst brightness itself, or or how for what do you mean photometric in this case? So that would be the the reddening that you see in the in the object. How uh, so we we know the the typical luminosities that are involved uh, mm -hmm. in in GRBs. So there is some sort of you know standard candle distance scale that you can apply, yes. mm -hmm. although it's not perfect yet. Just how you have in you know. Uh, uh, Type mm -hmm. one supernovae, but it, it people are trying making a huge effort to come up with a distance scale. And there are a few, there are some correlations that people use to determine, uh, to establish a distance scale and see if they can actually understand the redshift. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Roman Deep. I have a question. Do you have like an estimate of the frequency of occurrence of these events and how many? We, we get like one per million or how many? <laughs> yeah, good question. So, uh, so, you know, of course, as an observer, one is interested in how many can we actually see? So, mm. so with the Fermi uh, Gamma Ray Observatory, which is the premier observatory that studies, uh, studies these sources, uh, you expect to see and, you, and, you know, something that they had uh, initially before launching, they, they thought they would be able to see 200 of these events per year. So I think they've done, they've outperformed. They, they probably see, I think over the six years or seven years of mission uh, in one of the works uh, that they quoted, uh, they saw about 235 events per year on average. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's only a small fraction, right? So this is because it depends on the sensitivity as well. So as a whole, coming from, if you, you know, uh, put in population synthesis studies, which look at star formation and how many GRBs did you expect to see as a function of redshift, and the accumulated amount uh, that you see in the entire universe uh, is uh, about, I think, 4,500 uh, events that are beamed towards us per year. Mm -hmm. So if you had you know, infinite sensitivity, 
you should be able to see, uh, you know, uh, more, uh, more than 4,000 events per year. But because we don't have that, so we're, we're down to 200 or 300 or so events per year. Okay, we have time for a last question from Laurent. Yes, hi, a very interesting talk, thank you. Uh, I, I had a question about the, the progenitors of the short gamma ray. So you said that in principle, the idea was that it could be two neutron stars or, or black hole and a neutron star. The, yes. the only one that's been detected so far is the, is the latter, no? Yes. Uh, and of course, I, I imagine that the, the gravitational wave uh, form that would be generated by a black hole neutron star merger would be different yes. from uh, from what is seen in a neutron star neutron star. But do you expect also the gamma ray itself to be different? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so what? what I, so there are various things that are going going to be very different. Uh, for example, the, the debris that is generated uh, when you have a neutron star neutron star merger and, and the jet of course has to pass through such a debris is gonna be different from uh, when you have two neutron star merging and when you have a neutron star and a black hole because one of the object is a black hole, most of that debris will be sucked in. Uh, so then it's a, even a question of, I mean, can you even launch relativistic jets when you have a neutron star and black hole? Although it is theorized, but in practice, can you actually do that? Uh, and then, one interesting thing that will happen is uh, in a neutron star neutron star merger, there are a lot of baryons floating around in the surrounding environment in which the jet has to pass through. Because you have more baryons, it sort of slows down the jet. So the final Lorentz factor that you get is decreased when you have more baryons. Now, when you have a black hole and a neutron star, that problem is sort of minimized because most of the stuff is already sucked into the black hole. Whatever is, is remaining is in this is debris disk or a torus. So there is not much in the way of the jet. Uh, so you might even expect things to become uh, very highly uh, with high Lorentz factors, even you know, going to thousand uh, extreme Lorentz factors. And then uh, in that case, the prompt emission will be, because the Lorentz factor is different, the timings, the time scale over which things are emitted will be different because it's a very strong function of how fast the object is moving. Uh, but again, I come back to the point that Although theoretically we, we, we expect to see it, but in practice, it, it might be very challenging. So, so that what you're saying is that most of the short uh, GRVs that we've seen so far are probably neutron star, neutron star. Then. Probably, yes. Uh, I mean, with certainty, we cannot say that because we didn't have gravitational detectors. So now that we do, uh, uh, and then we've only caught just one object you know, uh, gravitationally, but uh, I, I hope in, in the next year or two, things will take off very soon. It's been two actually, no? there's been a second, a much noisier. There is a yeah, much noisier one that is, yeah, that's right, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ramandeep. We will break here for a two or three minutes and we'll reconnect with you in the, in the different link that I sent. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everyone for attending this. Thank you for listening.